Good afternoon, uh, buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Uh, could we gradually ask you to take kindly your seats? It's always a pleasure to start the afternoon session. And we appreciate that the people are turning out nicely for that. We have only one hour and a half. So, oops. Uh, we should be a bit cautious with the timing. Well, I will continue with the introduction. This is the UNIDO team. We are going to talk today about the industry from the perspective of the United Nations. We are going to talk about the partnerships, about the sustainable industrial development. We are going to talk about some of the issues and some of the solutions. And we want to deliver several messages to you on behalf of UNIDO, which are quite new. So I'm try I will try to make it interactive because we are shaping our scene in the agenda for the sustainable development goals after the 2015. And we are also very interested to hear your opinions. In fact, we are more interested to hear your opinion than just to make the presentations, but we do want to sell, uh, to sell some of the messages. Let me introduce my team first. To my right is Mr. Christian Susan, who is our specialist uh, in water. Uh, he deals with a large range of issues at UNIDO, and uh, one of his important projects you will see in the presentations. And again, to my right is the Sabina Haspel. She is also our profound specialist in the partnerships. Today the subject is energy, water, partnerships, and she will develop uh, on that issue of the partnerships. We will make one presentation, but we will change the speakers. And in the meantime, I will try to also to moderate and open the floor so that we can hear your opinions on some of the issues and we can also switch and don't, not to have all the time the presentations today. Finally, I myself, my name is Igor Volodin and I'm the unit of focal point for water. Well, now we can start. Let me say while the people are still coming a few words. A lot of people here outside the UN so let me say a few words about UNIDO. UNIDO stands for the Industrial Development Organization, uh, United Nations, of course, with the 800 staff members and representation in more than 50 uh, countries of the world. We also have the networks of so-called National Cleanup Production Centers. Uh, which we have uh, in more than uh, 50 countries. And we have so-called investment and technology promotion offices, which are mostly in developed countries. We have eight of them. Now, by our mandate, we deal primarily with the developing countries and economies in transition. Now, let me start from an important milestone which we had in December. And that one is the 15th uh, UNIDO uh, General Conference, which took place in Peru, in Lima. And it, it came up with a very important declaration, which we call a uh, Lima II uh, declaration, or the declaration with the name Inclusive and Sustainable Industrial Development. And I will explain to you what the inclusive and what is the sustainable development means, at least from the perspective of UNIDO. Now, 
that was attended by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Pan Ki Moon, and that's a very rare occasion that uh, the Secretary General attends uh, the General Conference of one of the UN agencies. Now, let me go all over the uh, UNIDO subjects. Uh, UNIDO deals with the basically three subjects, poverty reduction through productive activities, trade and capacity building, and energy and environment. Now, I was trying to explain to you also about the declaration, what we have in mind when we say inclusive. Inclusive for UNIDO, and this is a new approach. Inclusive, what UNIDO means is that uh, all the partners should take part in the development process. That is, of course, the UN, the governments, industry, academia, financial institutions, civil society. But important part also is that there should be a, a equal distribution of the results of these uh, partnerships to all the partners, and that is stressed in the declaration. Now, sustainable development, I will, I'm going to show you what we mean by the sustainable industrial development. But first of all, let me put this slide. It's a bit not so well to read, but I'll try to explain to you what we mean by that and uh, what we would like to illustrate. We would like to illustrate the need for sustainable industrial development. This is the slide which was, uh, it's a flash of the economic development, uh, which was made in the year 2011 by the United Nations Environmental Program. Uh, you don't have to read it, I will explain. Vertically, we have an equivalent of the resource consumption. And horizontally, we will have a GDP per capita. So, and this is how we have uh, done so far within the, mostly within the 20th century. So if you see where India is in this uh, chart, uh, per capita income is below a uh, thousand US dollars, which is, you understand, is very, very miserably low. Now if we go, China is a bit more, but still within the proximity of thousand. Brazil, is around 5,000. United States of America is a bit below 30,000. But what we would like to see, and this is a, a pattern which probably we should break, but this is how we've been doing so far, is that with the growth of the income per capita, the resource consumption is also growing. Now let's see, and we already saw that India and China and Brazil are quite low with the population of what they have. If they see if they move along the same line of development, if they move towards the even not 10,000 but uh, 30,000, 10,000 or more, what will that imply in terms of the resource consumption? So the message is we cannot continue like that. We cannot continue like we've done so far. However, we have to continue the development. And that's why uh, this is the challenge. We have to decouple the uh, process of development with the resource consumption. In other words, we should do more with less, and this is uh, basically the major message of the UNIDO concept of sustainable development, to increase the standards of living, health care, and the quality of life, and to reduce the resource consumption, pollution, waste impact on nature. Today's panel about the energy and environment. What we are saying, at least at the policy level, and we will show you some of the solutions. 
because you need to deal with the enterprise level. It is naturally a lot easier for you needle to address resource consumption in general because water is a resource, energy is a resource, but we also have other natural resources which are used during the manufacturing processes at least. And then at the end of that we have waste. So to address this issue, UNIDO has developed a concept which is called the so-called Green Industry Initiative. And it has two parts, greening of the existing industries and creation of new green industries. And for the existing industries, basically, what we mean is helping the enterprises improve resource productivity and environmental performance through the certain things you see below. I'm not going to uh, read them. For the new industries, we would like to establish the new operations delivering environmental goods and services. Again, you see, I hope this presentation will be made available to everyone so I don't go into the details. But if there would be questions from the audience, I'll be happy to answer them. Now, and what we are uh, proposing as the, uh, at the policy level at least, and as an implementation, this is a joint initiative which is stemming from the Rio Plus 20. Uh, which was launched by uh, UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program and UNIDO, is a so-called green industry platform. And I'm moving already into the partnership, so sorry for Bina, Sabina, I'm taking part of your breath. But what is the green industry platform? It's an integrated framework to support the greening of the industries. It creates an enabling environment, supports industry-led initiatives, and it harnesses environmental technologies. So the benefits of the green industries, we can break them into the three parts, the economic, social, and environmental benefits. Of course, we deal with the industries in developing countries and economies in transition with the private industries primarily. So for them, the economic benefits are very important. And this is the left column where they are always uh, come up with us, more innovation and growth increase resilience to the market changes through the certain things. Now, for the society at large and for the UN, of course, the social benefits are extremely important and also for UNIDO. And we have more employment, we have the rising standards of living and the incomes and empowerment of the certain groups, again, through the certain Actions. Now, environmental benefits are extremely important for the society at large, and we have more efficient resource use, less waste, and um, uh, better, uh, less pollution. Now, the green industry platform, again, is a public-private partnership. I will only say a little bit about the uh, green industry platform, it's an example. So I'm preempting uh, the part of the presentation of Sabina, but it's a partnership between the government, private sector, civil society, and academia, uh, which each of the partners has a certain value added. And the outputs for that are the green industry policies and the best practices and the toolkits, and then the result, the outcome, well, we call it, is the better governance of the industrial clusters and the better governance of the economy and at large. Now business partnerships, Sabina, maybe you can take a floor and give me a little bit of, of a rest. And could you pro explain? To, uh, could you say a few words in the introduction? What kind of partnerships would you like to take? Um, I turned this one on, so. Fine. If that's okay for you, I can I don't know stay right if you here. can see the. That's fine, I have it all here. Um, so let me maybe first say um, that address the, the change of identity. So I'm not Barbara Chrysler. 
Barbara would have very much liked to come, but she had to uh, change plans last minute, so I'm stepping in uh, for her. And I'm working for uh, the Business Partnerships Group, as uh, Igor has already mentioned. So we're um, a non-technical group that addresses specifically the partnership um, tool within UNIDO's technical assistance uh, portfolio. Why should we partner? Maybe you can start all together. Why should we partner? Sure. Um, it's a partnership here. So, so the question is what is in it for UNIDO, right? Um, and for the others. And people. for the others. You're already being very uh, empathetic, uh, imagining also the, the win for the other side. That's already a good basis, I have to say. So um, let me start maybe with the obvious answer to this question, which probably comes to mind first, that is resources. Um, and it's a legitimate point, of course. Um, when we look at the relationship between ODA, Official Development Assistance, and uh, FDI, Foreign Direct Investment, we see and we have seen over the past decade a trend um, that is very substantial, which is that the um, foreign direct investment, pri private inflows into uh, low-income and middle-income countries are already about threefold to fourfold the volume of uh, official development assistance. So as a technical assistance provider and um, um, agency um, whose mandate it is to um, work on sustainable, inclusive and sustainable industrial development, um, UNIDO has to adjust to this new reality, of course, and um, the trends are even uh, going in this direction. So we will see more and more uh, private sources of funds and private money um, going into those, those areas. So that's a legitimate reason for us to partner, of course. But however, that said, UNIDO does not see the business sector as simply a cash cow or as a fundraising ac activity. Um, there's much more to a partnership than uh, simply the, the dollar signs. It's a natural reflex, maybe, but it's also dangerous because it distracts from the, the breadth and wealth of uh, possibilities that, that there are. So one thing that is for us more and more important and actually maybe the essence of partnership is expertise. Uh, the private sector uh, has cutting-edge technology, skills, and know-how that for UNIDO would be unattainable otherwise. Um, we would not be able to afford nearly uh, what we can get if companies actually work with us and uh, share what they have to offer. Another one is, of course, access to networks. And if they have one thing, uh, private companies usually have networks uh, and contacts. So that can give you access to governments, to local authorities, uh, regional, national authorities. Uh, also a way and in way maybe to influence policy around this angle. Um, then, of course, um, companies come from a country and we work with globally with all nations and all countries, um, which, of course, also might give um, a good argument to um, address bilateral agencies, uh, as well as, say, um, regional funds, for example, or regional development banks. So we've actually seen this happen, that uh, companies from a certain country helped us also unlock funds that they did not contribute, but basically uh, had a cat catalytical influence here. So, um, of course, one other very important dimension is that it gives you a way to a basis to work with those companies that you're partnering with. This means that uh, there might be a way to even address their own methods of working, their operational uh, setup. And um, this can lead to, to a whole set of, of integ an integrated approach. Um, so what I would think that UNIDO values most in the partnerships that we have is that they give us relevance for our technical assistance. Uh, make sure that we have cutting-edge technology and the latest state-of-the-art know-how to, to um, implement them. And then they help make projects sustainable uh, because it's another source of funding, of course, and it's other actors that are automatically 
on board already. Uh, at the same time, it helps to address complex issues in an integrated and holistic way. This is also just by um, the virtue of how business works. Business usually doesn't see one problem as assigned to one department or one technical expert or something. It usually sees uh, a problem as a complex barrier to doing business. And that means that usually they don't see any fragmentation of a, in, in their response to this problem. So this can also help us to really find an integrated solution to the problem. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, last but not least, resources <laughs> uh, by direct contribution or by increased efficiency. Well, thank you very much. It's very great. Now, can you tell me what kind of the partnership UNIDO has? I'm a part of UNIDO. Maybe you could elaborate <laughs> on that a little bit. That's news to me. Um, well, and what are the ones which would be most efficient, most suitable for the energy and water nexus? Let's put okay. it all together. Yes, let me, let me answer those two together. So what type of partnerships does UNIDO have? Um, well, we have a set of categories that we defined. Um, I won't bore you with the exact details of definitions and so on. I'll keep it very practical for you. But just let me share with you the basic uh, groups that we have. So we have core business and value chain partnerships. Those are the ones that concern the main products and services of this company, of the private sector entity, their main operations, the way, the main, uh, way they produce those, and um, their value chain or supply chain as well. Um, so what these um, partnerships do is they redesign the products and services themselves to be targeted better to, to um, say a certain community or circumstances or to be more environmentally sustainable, less uh, resource intense uh, and so on. We also integrate, localize and upgrade the value chain and supply chain in this, in this type of partnership. Another one, also very straightforward, is a philanthrop philanthropic giving or social investment. This is um, really business either writing a check, which is we, we haven't seen much of that uh, in recent times. This is really um, how maybe this whole inter, this cooperation started, but uh, we see less and less of that. But what we still see is social investment, which is a strategic investment in a certain market, in a certain, say, um, again, suppliers, um, etc. And then the third category, which is becoming more and more um, prominent, say, in our portfolio. That's the multi-stakeholder or transformational partnership type. So what does it take for a partnership to be multi-stakeholder? Uh, well, multiple um, types of entities that are part of um, the partnership. And uh, to be transformational, which means they have to address a systemic issue. They have to really look at a problem in a very systemic way and to maybe change the rules of the game, change uh, how, how things are done in a very fundamental way. Um, so another thing is that they should include all relevant actors, public, private, NGOs, academia, anybody else who's so what relevant? We, what, which ones would be the most efficient for our case? Yes. Um, that's actually the, the one million euro question, I guess. And True. I have to, to million. try to get around it a bit by saying it depends. <laughs> um, but let me give you, rather than a, a fixed recipe, um, to give you maybe the main ingredients that uh, such a partnership should, should have, depending on the purpose, the concrete purpose, the context, uh, the resources available, and say something like the degree of flexibility that you need to implement. So some of the key ingredients from my perspective are uh, you have to first identify the suitable partner or partners that are willing and able to deliver. You have to understand their incentive structures. This is very important to see what is in it for them or what um, drives them, really. What are they uh, in for? And then um, it's very important to find all relevant actors, but not the, no unnecessary actors who could be then stumbling blocks. 
Then second, I would suggest um, that you design a partnership framework or uh, a governance structure that really suits the, the purpose. Um, you should define roles very clearly, uh, define um, value contribution, uh, value proposition, and uh, of course, be very clear on the objectives, uh, the common objectives. And then put in place a decision-making structure that, again, allows for an equitable say, but also reflects the different roles. Uh, third, implementation. Um, there are different ways. Uh, what has been found to work very well for us is a sequenced approach, where we start with the pilot phase. Um, there should always be re-evaluation, of course, maybe a remodeled pilot, uh, and then scale up or replication in order to secure maximum impact. Excuse um, me, can yeah, I sure. break you? Yes. I, you took out of my mouth my next question. I'm so sorry. The, <laughs> lessons learned, you are going into the lessons learned, which I'd like to defer to a little oh, sure. bit a later stage actually to both of you. Now yeah. at this stage I would like to pick one or two comments or questions from the floor. If there are any, so we've been offering two messages. One is the need for the inclusive and sustainable industrial development one. And the second is a possible solution, is a partnership. From our point of view, the, uh, this is one of the solutions, business partnerships. Anything? It's a tool, I would say. True. That's it. <laughs> <coughs> ladies first. Yes, thank you very much. Your, your summing up was quite comprehensive. But you said very um, clearly that partners have to be willing and able to make a contribution uh, and you also want to be inclusive. So how do you cater for the, um, the reality that some partners are more equal than others? That maybe especially in the, in the area of NGOs and civil society they might be willing to participate but they do not have the equal means of for instance business partners. Could I give her the answer to that because we have some examples actually. So maybe there would be a part of the answer, but please carefully note it down because this is coming. John. My, my question is a little related to the last one in the sense that in the business world we often go with joint ventures where partners form a sort of intermediary company and equally contribute and they share the risks and responsibilities and liabilities. And I wondered if that was part of the equation in any of the UNIDO setups. Well, thank you very much. Do we need an answer or you have a, something to respond immediately to the Jones? Now we continue. Uh, we want to give you some of the examples. So Mr. <coughs> Susan, could you tell us, and this is the public-private uh, public partnership uh, for the Carlsberg, Baltica. So could you give us a little bit introduction of how it came into being and uh, the major, you know, thrusts of that and how does it address the subject of this conference? Thank you very much, Igor. Well, Carlsberg and Baltica, they're breweries for those who don't drink beer and might not know. Uh, Baltica is the Russian subsidiary of Carlsberg. Basically, Carlsberg decided a couple of years ago to majorly invest in buying up breweries. And they didn't only do it with a business ideal, a business goal in mind, they also had a very strong corporate social responsibility which drives this process and supports it. And there's three key elements Carlsberg wants to achieve in its business. It's energy efficiency, it is water consumption, and pack packaging sustainability. So I think the answer how it came to this Nexus approach, there are already two of these elements strongly represented. And again, Carlsberg and Baltica, they were aware, they had McKinsey doing a, an assessment of their water footprint of the product, of one liter of beer how much water is embedded in this product. And they came up with the figure of 25 liters in average, whereas 90% of this water consumption 
uh, in the agricultural sector. So they're very efficient. They've managed to fine tune the water consumption, the energy consumption in their breweries themselves. But then they realized, well, the major lump of our water consumption lies outside our direct control. And that's when they decided to partner up with a UN agency that Carlsberg and Baltica could become a proactive environment steward who doesn't only look at its own production facilities but goes beyond, basically to work along the supply chain to provide technical assistance to the suppliers, to the agro-industries uh, agro to reduce their environmental footprint. And what are the core elements of this partnership? If you want to work along this supply chain, there is one element which is develop a comprehensive footprint methodology. So far, if you compare figures, if you go through the literature, you will see that to produce one liter of beer, you need four liters of water or 100 liters of water. Definitely, some of the brewers are less efficient. But the major reason for such huge differences is that the brewers use different approaches to measure their water consumption per liter of beer and energy consumption and resource consumption. So one, the first step would be, we will develop together with Carlsberg a comprehensive methodology to measure their environmental footprint. And this will be based on the European Union uh, initiative to define system boundaries in product category rules. Basically, they come up saying, if you look at breweries, everyone has the same concept in mind. It starts with agricultural, certain elements in agriculture, it starts with, then the next step is production, and then the end use of the product, that you have a cradle to create great approach. Well, once you've identified where this major footprint lies, it was easy for water, we could base it on the McKinsey report, but when you look into other inputs, factor inputs into production of, the, of beer, it is not yet so clearly spelled out. So basically that's where we're going to provide then technical assistance to the agro-industries along the supply chain to reduce their water and energy footprint. And beer is a product which contains a lot of water, a lot of water is used for the production, and again, a lot of agricultural resources go into this production cycle, and then during the process, you need energy to brew the beer. Well, uh, once you have identified these possibilities, and for the identification of these possibilities along the supply chain, we will work on the UNIDO test methodology. We'll dwell on this later on. But in brief, test is a methodology you help to, you help your partners to identify where they're inefficient. You show them basically in your production process. Here you have an inefficiency. You show the industries how much it costs them, the present inefficient practice, and then either this inefficiency can be overcome with a change in management patterns, it can be overcome with some small-scale investment or larger-scale investments, and for each of these investments, if you want the industry to do it, you need to show them what's the return on investment. And this is our flagship product. It's been working very well because often in those industries, especially in developing countries and countries in transition, people are not aware of the inefficiency and they're not aware of the cost of inefficiency. Once you demonstrate them how much money they lose and how they become more cost effective and how their profit margin can be increased, these investments are being triggered. And you create this win-win situation where on one hand, the industry becomes more competitive, their profit margin increases, but also the environmental impact decreases. Well, thank you very much. Can I break you? I have some deferred ones, but uh, because you're going into the test, so don't I take my breath. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, think of the replication, think of the climate change, so two of you have the deferred questions already for the later. Uh, we're going more and more into the forest. I think... Uh, We've been talking uh, until now about the process water. You are now throwing the footprints, the water footprints, energy footprints. Now, the question is, it's, uh, these are the very important parts. How do we also address the footprints in the developing countries, in the small and medium scale industries, and in the economies in transition, what capacity do they have actually to do that? So think of that as well. Now, you, I can elaborate a little bit. The Baltica project is being financed by the Global Environmental Facility. And the Baltica contribution is around 30 million. Uh, and the 
global environmental facility 6.3 and the Russian Federation is about 1 million US. Now I would like to also elaborate a little bit on some other UNIDO partnerships and this is important related to the Minamata Convention on Mercury. Uh, UNIDO is a part of the Global Mercury Partnership and UNIDO leads artisanal uh, and small-scale gold mining in that partnership and you see the other part of industrial applications which are elaborated in the Minamata Convention on Mercury where UNIDO is not the leading but it is contributing quite a bit. Uh, there are some of the important parts of the Minamata Convention, but for the sake of time, if we have time at the end, then probably we can discuss them if someone is really interested in that. But Mercury is all about, or at least you need a part of Mercury in the Minamata Convention is all about water. Uh, in general, Minamata Convention is about water, air, and surface pollution. Now test or transfer of environmentally sound technologies. And with this is we are coming to the solutions. We've been offering one solution which is the partnership and we gave you some of the examples. Now another solution, it is a UNIDO flag program which is called again transfer of environmentally sound technologies or test. And the overall objective is to support sound management of resource use at the priority industrial hotspots and to minimize the use of the resources and maximize productivity through the demonstration of the best practices, application of clean technologies and the capacity building. So in general from this definition, it's about the transfer of technologies, but the transfer of technologies is a part of the methodology. It's about the better management. In fact, it's about doing things differently at the industry level in developing countries and economies in transition. And we can demonstrate that the industries can achieve a lot with this methodology. You see this is the uh, global application of UNIDO. These are the countries where UNIDO has the test programs and we are, the programs have been financed by various donors. It's just to uh, give you a little bit of the history of that, that the test, integra test integrated approach was developed uh, within the UNIDO uh, executed GEF project for the Danube River Basin and uh, the test consists of basically five management tools aimed at changing practices and the industrial behavior. So these are the major five tools of the test, resource efficiency and the cleaner production or recipe, environmental management systems or AMS, EMA, environmental management, they are extremely important, uh, seems to be a dry subject but you, when you start talking to the industries it's becoming such a lively discussion, you cannot believe that. Uh, environmentally sound technologies, this is where we are coming to the technology transfer and the corporate social responsibility or sustainable enterprise strategy. So what this is what we would like to emphasize. We're not leaving it at the technology. We would like the enterprise to be and continue to be uh, sustainable in terms of the resource consumption. And that's how it is. I will skip that because of the time limitations. So the... Uh, <coughs> In the fundamentals of the test very rapidly, uh, integrated approach which links sustainability to the core business strategy, management systems and the process itself. So it's a little broader than the process, uh, a lot broader. Benchmarking. So we benchmark the uh, company performance with the best ones uh, in the cluster. Training, monitoring or capacity building. Top management engagement is a key. If we don't have management, top management on board, we should forget about that. Multidisciplinary skills, 
flexible approach depending on the size, country baselines, and a number of other parameters. And of course, linkage to the existing financial investment schemes, particularly important for the SMEs in developing countries. Now, and uh, this is again the example. So we are showing you these certain instruments, but we also show you how we have been doing with some of them. And we believe that we've been doing very well. Um, and an example is a so-called MET test or Mediterranean test a project, which was financed by the Global Environmental Facility as a part of the largest scale strategic action plan project which is still being implemented by UNEP. UNEP is the lead agency. You know Jeff likes these types of the partnerships, multi-UN agency approaches. For UNEDA, this part has been finished. And we had three countries, Tunisia, Morocco, and Egypt, and the funding, we had one million from Jeff and around uh, one, Point nine, uh, I'm sorry, point nine, a little below one million from the uh, Italian government. We are very thankful. And the rest was coming from the private uh, industries in these three countries. So we had the coverage of 43 industries. We have the case studies on our homepage. Please come and see them. And you see the duration of the project. Now, Selection of the companies, partnerships. I don't want to repeat genuine interest. So what is it in for the small and scale industries in that? Environmental issues which need to be addressed. Of course, the management commitment. And then, of course, very important part which I would like to add when you go into practice. Financial viability, if the enterprise does not, I mean the production does not make sense, there is no point probably to intervene. <coughs> Let's the market work for that. Now components, we have three in each of them and we implement these three components with the, depending on the uh, country, again we have a flexible approach but always we have the three, capacity building, pilot demonstrations, dissemination, and replication. I don't want to go into the details because I'd like to show you the results. From our perspective, they are quite impressive. Now we, you see the priority sectors. Again, the sector selection is a subject to a separate discussion. We can have it in the corridor. But these are the very typical industries for the three countries. Agro food, textile, leather, Again, metal, ceramic, chemicals, pulp and paper. You see the numbers in this chart. <clears throat> now, achievements. This is becoming more interesting. Now, on the left side, you see the amount of measures. We are going into the <clears throat> uh, enterprise audit and we identify the solutions, the technical solutions, the management solutions. So, the, you see, have been like uh, 600 measures altogether implemented, uh, more than 600 identified and 600 to improve. And very important is on the right side, the return on the investment or so-called payback period. You see, of course, the largest payback period, more than 50%, is for the measures which we call low-hanging fruits which do not require uh, much of the capital which could be done on the spot and fix the things. Then, of course, we have uh, like 23% uh, with the payback between half a year and one and a half years. And then again, quarter, which is, uh, we believe it's quite an achievement. These are the measures with the payback period of more than one and a half to, the, to four years and where the industries, the companies, they need investment, external investment, they need an external capital. So they go to the market. Now the results in terms of the uh, figures, we had six national partners, partnerships. We had 30 trainees, train the trainers so these people can work. 
already and they are working and they continue 43 demonstration industries whatever amount of mandates of training but uh, on the left um, the bottom we had the 16 million US dollars per year economic savings all recorded you see in our case studies you have more than uh, around 10 million cubic meters of water savings and we have we had energy savings per year uh, like a quarter of a million megawatt per year of energy savings but leveraging in terms of the financing if you go very <coughs> down we had if you remember two million of the project money introduced into the companies and that was leveraged by 20 million of private sector investments for the future so it's one to ten we believe this is very remarkable in developing countries and this is very important for us to demonstrate and that's why we are going to the next part and this is a switch mat and we are very happy and proud to tell you that in December we signed a contract for nearly 20 million euros with the European Commission to replicate the Mediterranean test project uh, we are partnering with the UNEP in this and uh, yeah we have several partners uh, cleaner production regional activity centers in Barcelona, UNEP Mediterranean Action Plan and U UNEP uh, office in Paris and we are going to do that in nine countries already so this is a very good achievement for us I stop at this I have a number of other slides on this subject but we had s several different questions already and I'm ready to pick several more maybe two three so the floor is open questions to the test and to everything which has been already presented fine this is the floor is still open okay Josephine has a question well maybe maybe I didn't get it when you were talking but it it, isn't, it wasn't too explicit to me, like, for example, in the Carlsberg case or, or in the cases of the partnership you were talking about, um, the issues of, of energy, you know, also energy efficiency. Maybe you can give us a little bit more information on that. Thank you. Well, I can preempt that because if we work on the enterprise level and we are talking about resource efficiency, you know, because if we take the factory as a box, so what comes in? goes out and the last thing we want to say garbage in garbage out so we want the good resource in and no garbage out and uh, this is about the resource efficiency because at the enterprise level we have a, an opportunity to look actually at all the resources but energy and uh, water are the primary focus for instance for the Mediterranean test and will be for the switch mat why is that because of the target the target group is the large marine ecosystem of the Mediterranean so coastal area pollution coastal tourism so why we're doing that that's why we are very much particular about the water in all these operations now Chris will tell you about why is it so important for the breweries obviously breweries water consumption but this is would be my introduction to preempt the discussion. Chris? Well, for Carlsberg, as Igor has presented, there is a 30 million dollar investment the breweries will affect themselves. It would have been difficult for the global environment facility to provide support which is targeted to one single industry. So 30 million dollars will be invested by the breweries applying the test methodology to identify opportunities to increase their water and energy efficiency at their production site. On one side we will introduce also an innovative waste to energy a process which under the present economic framework conditions in Russia would not be feasible. So five million dollars will be invested by Carlsberg and the subsidy element of one million dollar will be included by Jeff to make this economically feasible. To co-treat liquid effluents from the breweries 
with the spent grain in an anaerobic, anaerobic digestion system, which then with this subsidy becomes economically feasible. We did quite a comprehensive assessment of all the 11 brewers operated in Russia and energy prices in Russia vary substantively. So even with this grant element of $1 million, it could only become feasible in the Far East in one of the brewers operated by, by Baltica. And what we will do again is later on, we will disseminate this knowledge. We try to influence also the regulatory framework to create some economic instruments and regulatory instruments that similar approaches can be replicated. But the key message is here that such an investment from a business perspective only makes sense if there is an energy price which is high enough that this investment, six million dollars, you know, you need to have a return on investment if you talk private sector terms. Five years is already quite long for an investment. They would rather invest the money into other areas that have a short-term return on investment. But so this becomes feasible and this know-how and this knowledge about this technology will be disseminated through the Russian Breweries Association as well as through the BIA, this is the Breweries Environmental, uh, Brewers Industries Environmental Roundtable. These are all the key players on the global scale in breweries. And this is the major, you know, that's why you really see this water and energy nexus closely linked. You have wastewater which needs to be treated. You can treat it in a conventional way, where in the end you remove the nutrients, you invest a lot of energy, and you end up with clean water. Or you come up, you go an extra step, and that's the idea of this project, to go an extra step where you can co-generate water, uh, where you can uh, co-treat liquid effluence with solid effluence, and then rather than investing energy, you have a return in, in terms of energy out of this process. And again, most of the investments, the other investments are geared towards upstream and downstream. So the six million dollars of the Jeff investment will not go into the breweries because this was to distort the market. This is to promote water stewardship, water stewardship in catchment areas, Baltica shares with other water users. For instance, to demonstrate that a constructed wetland can be a very cost-effective solution to treat municipal wastewater. To treat wastewater on brewery sites beyond the regulatory requirements, where Carlsberg Baltica already has established state-of-the-art wastewater treatment plants, the water quality is still not sufficient that it allows infiltration into the groundwater to replenish depleted aquifers. So this is again the extra step that we can go with the Jeff money. It is this, uh, uh, in one model farm, again, Carlsberg has already been engaged quite actively with its agro-industrial suppliers. They have some farms which have been established as model farms, and in one of these model farms, a uh, sequenced batch reactor will be established so that wastewater can be treated, basically the output parameters can be adjusted. If you need nutrients in your wastewater, so you can uh, reuse it in drip irrigation, which is coordinated with the planting season. These nutrients can be recycled in agriculture. So rather than spending a lot of money to remove the nutrients from the wastewater, you reuse and recycle them. In those periods where you don't need these nutrients in the re in, for the plants growth, the wastewater still has to be treated and these nutrients have to be removed. So this is one of, this, one of the demonstration facilities that will be established. And again, drip irrigation compared to conventional irrigation, nothing brings the water energy nexus closer together. If you look at irrigation, you have to bring your water to your plants and you spend a lot of energy. Water is heavy. And if you rather transport one cubic meter than 10 cubic meters to achieve the same growth, because if you have the sprinkler irrigation, 90% of your water is lost to evaporation or 80%, depending on wind situation. So this would be the, the elements where we try to address it and where the Jeff said, yes, it makes sense because we go into three focal areas. It addresses the water issue, international waters, there's a climate change issue to make the breweries more energy efficient in the production process, and there is the land degradation issue that we can produce the resources that are required with less inputs. And how is climate change tackled was one of the questions. One of the elements will be to disseminate improved barley species. And that's going to be one of the really, I, I didn't know about this myself, but that's going to create one of the biggest win-win situations. So far, Russia is not self-sufficient in terms of barley production. So the barley has to be imported from other sources. So you have quite a large footprint in terms of CO2 for the transport. 
Furthermore, this improved barley, and that's not genetically modified material, this is a naturally occurring variety of barley through crossbreeding, but not genetically modified, which is not only more resilient to climate changes and to the drought conditions which might be expected and higher temperatures, but also in the brewing process itself, it needs less energy. So to disseminate this knowledge to the agroindustrial suppliers will enable them to gain benefits themselves because they can plant material. They have a client who will, who will uh, procure the plants they grow, the barley they grow, and then in the production process, while well, you reduce the environmental footprint, you, don't, you no longer have to import the material, and even in the brewing process itself, the carbon dioxide emissions will be reduced because you use less energy. But again, I want to reemphasize for the industry, we have a lack of opportunity to talk about the resource efficiency, because if we are looking at the factory, you know, we can do, but we can report, depending on to whom we are talking to, we can refer, uh, report on the water saving or on the energy, so we can single out individual pollutants. And uh, for instance, I mean the regulator on the spot would be interest, interested mostly in the BOD and COD reduction. But on the other hand, what does that mean? It means that you get the better quality of water as, uh, which goes down the drain. So yes, we are reporting on the BOD and COD reduction, but uh, we are looking into the water quality, which we are you know, releasing into the large marine ecosystem. So that's why we, again, but true, we report also depending on the audience, we report on the individual pollutants or energy or water, or even the footprints, which is an entirely different discussion. We are still new as everyone to that. Now we have one or two more different questions and we, I don't want to lose them. I, I think, I guess there was a question to Sabine uh, or from the part of the NGO that some, all the partners are equal, but some are more equal than the others. So the civil society is marginalized by in the partnership. Is that really the case for UNIDO? I mean, for the business partnerships, how do we deal? I tell you, we love the, in our part, we love the, actually, the civil society. But tell me what you think of this. Um, I'm not sure whether this was aiming at only civil society or in general about partnership selection. Um, but of course, I mean, not all partners are um, set up in the same way. Uh, not all come with the same resources. But that's um, by default. I mean, that's, that's part of partnerships. And um, I think my answer would be that, uh, first of all, we, we look very carefully at our partners. Uh, so that comes again to the, to the selection. And then we try to um, craft the partnership agreements in a way that reflects the different natures and also the different um, requirements of, of, of partners. So um, in addition to the three categories that we defined more in terms of well, from, from kind of the private sector perspective, uh, what makes their comp contribution. Uh, we also have every, every partnership we have is individual and has a different um, governance structure that reflects the members of, of this partnership. Um, and again, coming back to, to, to the selection of partners, uh, I don't want to bore you with the details, but of course we have our own guidelines, sets of principles, uh, we run a very thorough screening on partners before we um, get into bed with them, so to speak. Um, we call this uh, due diligence, um, another, a term we borrowed from the private sector as well. Uh, so we carefully screen them in terms of their environmental, social and governance performance. So this might come back also to your environmental question. Um, we make sure that the companies we work with suit our values, that they, we have matching our common values as a basis to work on. And um, so we look not only, aside from the specific 
project, the specific activities um, of the partnership, we look at their overall performance, all of their operations and how they conduct them. And then we might address those problems directly or we might decide that this is not the correct partner for us. Uh, and also another um, answer to your environment question, I think would be, um, we, we tend to forget this sometimes, but uh, Unido is lucky to have a lot of in-house expertise. So we would always rely on as many colleagues as might be interested in the proposed partnership, in the project, in the, in the idea, uh, and try to involve their perspective on it, which might be a different aspect of environmental sustainability. Um, say, not so much the, the resource efficiency, but um, you name it. <laughs> I'm not. You want to come in, Christian? Just allow me again to bring an example. Cooperation with CSOs. In this project, this Baltica, we also have a CSO component. And what we have to do is we have to save water and energy. And we need to create awareness for processes which help an industrial player to reduce its energy consumption. If you look at the bottling system, we are used in Europe that for many bottles you have a deposit system. So basically you pay something up front, you bring the bottle back to the store, you get your money back. This allows to reuse a bottle 20 times. And regardless how far you transport a bottle, you never ever can recover the amount of energy or spend the amount of energy which goes into the melting process to produce a bottle. So we are using CSOs in Russia to create awareness. Baltica will introduce a recycling system where they take their bottles back. It's interesting for them because it's also a saving, but it's also a huge environmental saving. If these bottles are not only recycled, if the glass is not only brought to a recycling container where it's crashed and mold, uh, melted again, but where the bottles, the Carlsberg bottles, will be reused up to 20 times. So again, that's where you can achieve quite a footprint reduction. And this is a job we know what we can achieve as you need, or Carlsberg know what they can achieve as a brewery. But this awareness creation in the civil society to really bring this message to the users, that's the best possible service provider is a CSO, and that's what we're going to use in this process. Well, thank you very much. The floor is open. It has been open for some time. We got one question. We're ready to pick more, and we have some, a few deferred. Okay, think of that. I have one more deferred question to both of you, which I promised. Lessons learned. In general, and in particular, if we have anything so far from Carlsberg. So, Sabina, first. I go first. Okay. So, um, lessons learned. Uh, we've been engaged in partnerships uh, for more than 10 years now. And we have our own, of course, um, lessons learned from that. Um, what I will do in, in light of the time restrictions is I'll spare you with the don'ts and I'll just give you the do's. I hope that will be all right for you. So, um, yeah, one thing that I've just mentioned a minute ago is uh, learn about your partner. That's very important. Select carefully and then once you've decided to work with one specific partner, be sure to understand them. Understand how they tick, understand their incentives, understand the, the the business case they see in it, and also how they work. And that brings me to the second point, which is uh, organizational culture. This is not to be underestimated. Um, we as UN have to be especially aware that we are a strange animal that is sometimes slow moving and um, maybe less responsive than private entities that we partner with. And we have to make sure to be always to have this in mind and to accommodate the differences in an organizational culture. Also in terms of synchronizing working methods, uh, keeping in mind uh, reporting requirements, um, M&D. It, it comes down to very basic things, uh, as in how soon do you answer an email? Um, as well, I would like to stress uh, that it's always important to ensure a broad organizational buy-in, and that goes, of course, for all the partners. Uh, from our perspective, as I just mentioned, it's very important to put every partnership on a very broad basis um, and bring in as many cross-cutting issues as we can. Some fall out by the side automatically because they're not applicable or 
not viable in, in uh, the financial framework of the, of the partnership. Um, but we try to really capitalize on our in-house expertise. Um, I think that was very well illustrated by what Christian said, actually, more than I can explain it to you. Um, so this is really in order to, to realize the full potential that is in this partnership. And then, um, again, the sequencing, we really like to work step by step, uh, build on what has been achieved, and then go a step further. Uh, and by that virtue, we already built um, trust in the partnership, a uh, personal relationship personal uh, on a personal level, which I think is one of those things that we came out to realize as a fundamental um, ingredient for success. So if you ask me what is it that um, characterizes the, the partnerships that uh, have been most successful, I would think it's that. It's, it's a personal level of, of trust, uh, knowing and understanding each other, which gives you flexibility as well. And um, uh, all partners are, are know what their what the common aim is, and then they work on a little bit of, of maneuvering flexibility. Um, also, it's important for us to rely on existing structures. This way, we are more efficient um, than uh, having to to implement a standalone project. Um, yeah, and another thing is that um, this is maybe due to our mandate. Uh, we are very close to the private sector in the first place. So for us, really, um, partnerships that address the core business expertise and operations work very well. Um, this is maybe very UNIDO specific, but uh, nevertheless, it has been a lesson that we learned. Um, another thing is that contributions at best are complementary, as little as possible of overlap, uh, not getting into each other's territory or, or creating uh, competition inside, but having complementary um, contributions to offer to make the partnership a success. And then also to have some sort of an equity within this balance of contributions, say, so that everybody feels um, yeah, fully appreciated, let's say. Yeah, I think from my side that would be kind of the the do's. <laughs> well, for me, the most important thing about lessons learned in working with industries to enhance their water and energy efficiency is what is feasible and what is not feasible. Private sector will always be driven. That's why it's private sector. They're profit oriented. So if there is water is available for free, no one will look into how much water you use. If the water price is very low, the company might be very corporate social responsible and say, yes, we want to do something about it. But then again, the possibilities about doing investments, you know, when it's a changed management pattern that you use less water, okay, no saving, no costs. They will do it. They will be happy to do it. But unless there is any economic incentive for a company or a regulatory pressure to do something, they will continue business as usual. If there is no regulation in place to reduce your effluence, well, treating effluents, unless you have such high organic loads in your effluent that they can really come up with a cost-efficient energy generation from your effluents, will always be an extra cost. So, and I think it's important that we understand what drives a private sector player. They will look, in the end of the day, they have a certain amount of money they can invest, and this money will go into areas where they see, see the highest return on investment. And I think that's why we have the strengths as you need with our technical expertise, for instance, the test to show companies that investing in some environmental aspects also has a return on investment that makes the company more profitable. And that's what creates the win-win situation. In the end of the day, the industry is not driven by, even if they're very corporate social responsible, yes, they want to shine, they want to publish a beautiful report at the end of the year, what they've done, but what's driving them is they want to increase their profit margin. And when you can do this and at the same time reduce the environmental impact, that's when you cre cre create this win-win situation. And what we can do is also to influence somehow the regulatory framework. We have another project in Tatarstan where a clear mandate by the Global Environment Facility is that we have to come up with economic, we have to jointly develop economic instruments with our partner institutions in the country and to see how the regulatory framework can be influenced in order to allow upscaling 
from projects will always be a drop of a, on a hot stone. But if you really want to change the business environment, you need to address this regulatory framework. You need to come up with stronger economic instruments. It was for me an eye open also to see that in one country, you look at Russia in the first step, sorry Igor, you would say it's not Russian. It's the same, energy prices, but they vary. They vary really by 50, 60, 70 percent. And what is feasible in one province is not feasible in the next province. And this is, I think, the key lessons learned. You cannot just take one approach which works in one place and disseminate it. You need to also see how you can influence the environment, the business environment. That's always what the private sector will operate in. And if we have a chance to do this by creating some economic incentives, by disseminating information which was gained in one project, experience and knowledge which has been gained with the help of public donor funds, then this can finally contribute to really achieve a larger scale change and to upscale these investments on a larger scale countrywide, nationwide and finally globally. Well, thank you very much. Again, the floor is open. Fine, still okay, Josephine. Um, thank you very much to both of you. I really think it's been very good, the illustrations and also the general points and of course Igor. Um, I just wanted, you know, you left a question on the on the plate. You said I'm going to tell you the do's, but I don't, I'm not going to tell you the don'ts. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you have learned in relation to what you shouldn't do when you're working in partnerships. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it's actually the flip side of the do's. <laughs> so um, implicitly, yes, I mean, um, it comes down very much to disregarding uh, what I've just tell you, told you as uh, the do's. Um, failure to communicate is one. Failure to budget is a very uh, mundane other one. Ignoring cultural differences. Um, and then, of course, choosing inadequate partners in one way or another. Um, neglecting buy-in shouldn't happen, but um, and then I think most of them are somehow uh, psychologically rooted. So uh, the next one that I've put down is one too much too soon, which is very hum human, but um, yeah, maybe puts you up for failure. Um, there's also something else that I still wanted to to say, and I might just abuse this chance to, to do so. Um, yeah, and it's, it's for this case of uh, the nexus, water energy nexus. Um, again, I mean, there, there can't be, I can't give you a recipe there, but um, I think that partnerships actually are a very uh, useful tool when we come to these transboundary issues um, or cross-cutting or whichever way you want to call them. Um, because again, I've, I've pointed that out. I think that uh, business is really very well placed to uh, help creating integrated solutions for complex uh, problems. That's one dimension. Uh, it can minimize the trade-off between the two, those two dimensions. Um, another one would be to um, allow for a certain push-pull strategy on our side, uh, which would be that um, you can incentivize companies to work with you or a whole industry to work with you with one of those two issues and then piggyback on it with the other or, you know, um, having, trying to, to capitalize on the attractiveness of one of those issues uh, for the industry, which I think is, is very much there. We've, we've heard before that there is uh, actually the need for um, technologies for innovation in many of those areas that, that have been addressed. And of course, the obvious one would be efficiency out of the synergy. So thanks for allowing me to digress a bit on the question. Uh, please, Kathleen. <coughs> Sorry. Thanks a lot for the uh, really interesting presentations. I had actually a question uh, coming back on Christian's remark. I think that's quite interesting, the point that you raised about the economic incentives and the, the appropriate regulatory structure. I'm curious, since you've had a lot of experience working with the private sector, I know from the work we've done at OECD, oftentimes there's a lot of resistance to putting in place abstraction charges or water prices 
or even appropriate regulations to deal with uh, water quality concerns. And sometimes that comes from the private sector, but I also think there are sometimes private sector players who, uh, if they're a bit more forward-looking and uh, the ones who are a little bit more on the cutting edge can turn into allies and, and also try to push the agenda on encouraging regulatory reforms and also economic incentives. Do you find it's a case that it's a mixed bag when, you, when it comes to uh, private sector positions on those types of issues? Well, I absolutely, absolutely agree, and that's one of the aspects where we're going to cooperate with Baltica and the regulatory bodies, basically to come up with something which makes sense for the environment and something which also makes sense for the industries. Because also someone like Carlsberg has an interest that you have a, a level playing field. You don't want to have a disincentive by being more environmentally aware and more environmentally friendly, whereas your neighbor keeps polluting. So yes, and the flip side is that often what we've seen in work with government agencies who have to come up with standards and guidelines and thresholds that have a tendency to be too rigorous. So it needs to be this discussion process. It needs to have bring the three players on one desk that they can discuss saying, okay, if you reduce the threshold to whatever value, this means for us as an industry, A, B, C, D, that there is this awareness because often the government agencies, and let's assume it's a country where there is no kind of kickback from, you know, I don't see the pollution, then it can work. And in, in other places, we've been working on a huge uh, phosphate factory in West Africa, which is a state-owned company and basically, as long as it's profitable the way it is, and even if there are complaints from other repairing countries that the pollution plume reaches two countries along the current, along the Guinea current, very little interest. Yes, they would be interested that the Jeff or someone provides the technology and pays for the technology, but there is very little interest from them by the, by the public authorities to introduce any thresholds, any guidelines, any standards, and there is since it's also a major contribu contribution towards the GDP of the country and towards taxes to change the situation. So it's, you cannot always achieve this win-win situation. You might wait as bad as for the environment, but it doesn't make sense for any donor country to come in. If the country is ready or the company is ready to take up a subsidized loan, African Development Bank, World Bank, yes, then you can su support them. We did in terms of references. We came up with a detailed technical concept. We said whether the product they're wasting right now could be recycled and reused. So the concept was there, but still there was a lack of interest by this industry really to invest. And since there was no pressure from the government, it won't happen most probably. But if you have players who have an interest really to influence their business environment, you can achieve very good results. Well, thank you very much. More questions? I have one. Well, an interesting part, of course, which I wanted also to highlight is that you need or manage several projects on behalf of the global environmental facility for the large marine ecosystem. One I already mentioned, that is the Mediterranean. Yet another is the Guinea current. And yet another is the Gulf of Mexico. So we are, we are in a very interesting and a critical stage to go into the phase two. And this creates, of course, a new level of the partnership, the governance of the, because there are five pillars of the LME approach or ecosystem approach for the LMEs. Number one is the governance. So how are we building the partnerships? And someone mentioned in the morning session the hypoxia or the dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico are other things like a deep water horizon and other things which have been also part of the discussion. So how are we governing all these types of the larger scale with all the partners? This is also a very interesting issue. Now, Chris, I had a question for you about the replication. How do you think we can replicate, if at all? the Carlsberg experience? Well, not even talking to, limiting it to breweries, but as long as you find a company which has an interest to really change the way to do business, and if you have gone through the due diligence process, 
because again, when we started with Carlsberg, we planned to sign an MOU. Before we got green light to uh, green light to sign this MOU, not only from legal but also we had to go through this due diligence process where the business partnership said, "Are these guys, are these the good ones? Can you work with them, or can't you do it?" Once you have such a partner and they're willing to really change their business and to invest, also, it's quite easy to replicate it. You will have to then to adjust it. What can be done in detail depends on on the framework conditions, the system setup, what is being produced, where it's being produced, what are the energy prices, what are the water prices, what incentives can be presented for the industry to really change their water and energy consumption. But it is replicable. But you need, first of all, you need someone from the private sector, one industry who's really interested in working along this field. So that's the most important thing. Well, thank you very much. Do we have questions? If not for the time being, we're not wrapping up the section. I have a dessert, a little bit of a dessert for you. I wanted to say at the end about the nexus between water and energy from the UNIDO point of view. And I will skip the trivial points like that the energy needs water and water needs energy. Uh, all these types of the... Uh, uh, nice uh, slides. Now, I wanted to show also some of the unique activities in the water and energy um, uh, nexus. And of course, uh, sustainable energy for all comes the first and the unit or YASA study on water energy nexus. And the definition of the critical linkage is big between the water and energy, opportunities, potential, and then the capacity development and the knowledge sharing. And this is how I would like to end that. Before I wrap it up, we started a bit later and I still have uh, two or three minutes. Do you have any questions on the whole session? or on that last part on the water and energy nexus of UNIDO? Josefina. Uh, sorry, I, I just have a, a comment more than a question on this issue of the viability that you were talking about before, maybe also linking to your, your analysis. I, I think, you know, it looks, sorry, you can't hear me that one. Um, I think, it, you know, the fact is that you have different partners and it looks to me that in, in the Carlsberg Bactica case, you know, the, the GF financing was very important to, you know, the financing to make it viable, that's what you were saying. If we can translate that also to the Thirsty Initiative of the World Bank, the Thirsty Water, so Thirsty Energy Initiative of the World Bank, they have a different kinds of partners. You have partners like Avengoa and people like that who have other interests and still they are interested in partnering. And I just wonder, you know, in both cases, you know, how much of the goals that you want to achieve, you know, whether it's the extension between the different actors having different goals or, or how you can, you know, maybe steer the process and, and make sure that, that even if you have those different goals, you can still, you know, agree on, on this kind of MOU if you want. You know, you agree on, on something that you want to do together and those tensions don't, don't have that kind of impact that may take it away from the original objective. Well, before I give uh, the possibility for the members of the panel, let me pick it on the different partners. First of all, our Director General comes from the, eventually from the World Bank. He was a Vice President of the World Bank some time ago, and he comes from the Ministry of Finance. So, and uh, he tells us, and I sincerely believe that we are talking to the same partners. One. Two is that uh, we gave you an example of the switch map, which is the European Commission. But simultaneously with this, it's a bit premature, but I want to. We are in the same region, actually, with the Union for the Mediterranean, with the headquarters in Barcelona. We were discussing... Uh, let's put it, a financial mechanism project for the transfer of environmentally sound technologies. 
with the EBRD, European Bank for the Reconstruction and Development. As you are probably aware, you are of course aware, is that uh, now EBRD is covering uh, the southern Mediterranean or northern Africa. Since, uh, if I'm not mistaken, don't quote me, this year. And uh, EBRD is sincerely looking for all sorts of the partnerships, you know, for the industries, for the green investments mechanisms. And uh, we, we are on the ground. We have the industries, which some of them have signed the global compact. And we have the ready mail pre-screened that they don't have to go through the, you know, through the whole pre-screening exercise. In fact, we are discussing a number of things. Well, the EBRD has their own. I mean, we cannot make for them the feasibility study, okay, because every investor wants to have its own feasibility study. But the kind of a pre-screening, pre-feasibility and help them with the financial mechanisms there. And uh, also actually spreading it to Turkey and the Balkan states. This is what we're doing. So we're talking the same partners, actually, this with the World Bank. If we're talking the same partners with the BRD, so we should be talking the same partners with the World Bank. Any questions, any additions to that? Well, the partners might be different because whether you're a large energy utility or a manufacturing industry, you follow different approaches, but the underlying philosophy, if I remember this morning, we saw this incremental cost curve. You know, basically, if water consumption increases, this would be the technical solutions, interbasin transfers or whatever needs to be done. And each solution was progressively more expensive. And again, then the idea was, well, at some point in time, it might become more feasible and cheaper to reduce the water consumption, to invest in whatever measures which are required to reduce the water consumption. And then... I think it's, it's pretty much the same approach. It's also what we show manufacturing industries, that you can have a return on your investment in energy efficiency, in water efficiency, in this application of environmentally sound technologies. And then the second fly you catch with one swat is that you also have the reduction of the detrimental environmental impacts. I would say it's pretty much the same approach, different partners, and each of us in this room here most probably we have different comparative strengths and com comparative advantages to work with different partners. And this work, the direct cooperation with manufacturing industries, that's where Unido can offer expertise, that's where we have the in-house expertise, that's where we have strong partners and experience. And I would be reluctant, for instance, to do a project like this Thirsty Energy Initiative because it's, it's not really where we have the comparative advantages. But if we cooperate, if we collaborate and exchange the ideas and basically if we see that in the end of the day we, it's not so much difference in between the approaches, it's just targeting different sectors, different industries. And then overall we can achieve to reduce the water consumption, the energy consumption in one country because it's again, it's puzzles, bits and pieces which, in, which are interlinked. Well, any questions, comments before we summarize and adjourn the session. We started 10 minutes later and I would like to have only one more, two more minutes. So, no. You see on the screen actually two abstracts from the Vienna Energy Forum last year. You know, on the Nexus, kind of an outcome of the discussion on the Nexus between water and energy so that you can also take into consideration. But if there are no more questions from the audience from the floor, let me summarize of what we wanted to say. We wanted to offer, you know, the inclusive and sustainable industrial development among the partnerships. We wanted to offer the Green Industry Platform as a partnership which is already existing among the other partners that it is still open for more partnerships. We opened, opened also some solutions and we believe that the further partnering is a solution and you saw the prerequisites for that. 
And, of course, uh, as the technical or technological solutions, we believe it has been very successful for us. We are offering the transfer of environmentally sound technologies. And this is a summary of that session. And with that, I would like to close this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, Christian. Thank you for this very lively panel. I think uh, we all learned a lot about what you are doing, hopefully. And uh, it was very nice to have this format of discussion as well. We are now having, you know, nearly half an hour break. You have uh, coffee time until 4.30. This idea of having a little bit longer coffee times is on purpose. So you have time to talk to each other. So these are, I learned that it's as important the free time as the uh, sessions themselves. So please go ahead and come back in about 4.30. Thank you very much. And we will have another very interesting session to relate to industry partnerships uh, led by UNEP. Thank you very much. <laughs>